Two skeptical scientists put their heads together and reached an amazing conclusion. There must be a God. From my earliest training as a scientist, I was very strongly brainwashed to believe that science cannot be consistent with any kind of deliberate creation. That notion has to be painfully shed. At the moment I can't find any rational argument to knock down the view which argues for conversion to God. We used to have an open mind. Now we realize that the only logical answer to life is creation, and not accidental random shuffling. Hoyle acknowledged that steady-state theories of cosmologies, of which he was one of the chief exponents in the 1950s, are not now tenable because of the evidence for evolutionary galactic and stellar processes. But the Big Bang view is similarly not tenable because of the way in which it implies the degradation of information. Of adherence of biological evolution, Hoyle said he was at a loss to understand biologists' widespread compulsion to deny what seems to me to be obvious. No matter how large the environment one considers, life cannot have had a random beginning. Troops of monkeys thundering away at random on typewriters could not produce the works of Shakespeare for the practical reason that the whole observable universe is not large enough to contain the necessary monkey hordes, the necessary typewriters, and certainly the waste paper baskets required for the deposition of wrong attempts. The same is true for living material. Once we see, however, that the probability of life originating at random is so utterly minuscule, small, tiny, as to make the random concept absurd, it becomes sensible to think that the favorable properties of physics on which life depends are in every respect deliberate. It is therefore almost inevitable that our own measure of intelligence must reflect in a valid way the higher intelligences to our left, even to the extreme idealized limit of God. From the beginning of this book, we have emphasized the enormous information content of even the simplest living systems. The information cannot, in our view, be generated by what are often called natural processes, as for instance through meteorological and chemical processes occurring at the surface of a lifeless planet, as well as a suitable physical and chemical environment a large initial store of information was also needed. We have argued that the requisite information came from an intelligence, the beckoning specter. We have received hints and even warnings from friends and colleagues that our views on these matters are generally repugnant to the scientific world. We in our turn have been disturbed to discover how little attention is generally paid to fact and how much to myths and prejudice. At all events, anyone with even a nodding acquaintance with the Rubik Cube will concede the near impossibility of a solution being obtained by a blind person moving the cubic faces at random. Now imagine 10 to the 50th blind persons each with a scrambled Rubik Cube and try to conceive of the chance of them all simultaneously arriving at the solved form. You then have the chance of arriving by random shuffling of just one of the many bipolymers on which life depends. The notion that not only the bipolymers but the operating program of a living cell could be arrived at by chance in a primordial organic soup here on the earth is evidently nonsense of a high order. Life must plainly be a cosmic phenomenon.
In short, there is not a shred of objective evidence to support the hypothesis that life began in an organic soup here on the earth. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him.